So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's great to have you all here. On behalf of the Kalamazoo Area Chapter President Jesse Davis, our executive committee, especially our programs committee, as well as our board members, we're excited to welcome you to tonight's webinar. I'm your host, Jason Ballou, a member of the executive committee and the chair of membership for the Kalamazoo Area Chapter. For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we are a nonprofit membership organization dedicated to promoting native plants and natural and sustainable landscaping. If you're interested in becoming a member, please visit wildones.org. You can also visit our chapter website at kalamazoowildones.org for more information about member benefits, programs and events, and helpful resources. We hope to see you soon at an in-person event or another webinar meeting soon. So before we get started, I have a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, you'll notice that your microphone has been turned off. Uh, you'll, we will be monitoring the chat box throughout the session. So if you have any questions or comments, please enter them there. Uh, and they will be addressed at the end of the presentation as time allows. Lastly, the presentation will be recorded for your review and to share with friends and family members. And we certainly hope you do. Now I have the pleasure of introducing Tom Small, who co-founded the Kalamazoo Area Chapter of Wild Ones back in 1999. Uh, he will be saying a few words about our speaker this evening. Thank you, Jason. Bill Schneider has been a good friend for a long time, a good friend to uh, me, to Wild Ones, and to native plants and the lovers of native plants in Michigan and, and everywhere. Since he founded Wild Type in 1996, Bill has, uh, has specialized in growing native plants from Michigan wild gathered seed. And the name of his nursery, Wild Type, borrowed from the genetic term wild type, reflects both the objective of Bill's nursery operation and his concern that he plans to talk about tonight about the future of native plant nurseries. Bill says that his, his emphasis has always been to produce native plants with enough genetic diversity to produce self-sustaining populations. Or in other words, to conserve not only the species, but the genetic diversity found in the wild population. And for Bill, that has always required wild collection of seed, and that's his specialty. A great majority of, of more than 300 species of native trees, shrubs, wildflowers, grasses and emergent wetland plants that Bill grows on his 10 acre nursery site are from wild seed stock and have not been bred or selected for uniformity. So Bill produces great plants. He produces truly genetically diverse species and like Bill, they are born to be wild. The, uh, the future of an operation like Bill's and of native plant uh, enterprises in general is faced with many uncertainties. There's an increasing threat to the ability to continue propagating plants capable of sustaining themselves in our quickly changing landscapes and climates. And that affects the choices available to Bill and to all of us. His 25 years of experience are invaluable to all of us. And tonight, he'll share his concerns about the future of native plant nurseries such as wild type and about the future of Michigan's natural landscapes and all of our efforts to naturalize our cities and suburbs. I don't think we would have been able to do it 
without Bill Schneider. And he's been our good friend and he has provided us with wisdom and with a whole lot of really wonderful native plants. So please join in welcoming an old friend and a mentor and a supplier of native plants for many wild ones. As much as concerns all of us. Welcome, Bill, and thank you. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, my great appreciation for the friendship and mentorship you've extended to me and an example that I, uh, I, I aspire to and many people in our community aspire to. So thank you so much. So uh, for those of you that don't know uh, me, uh, I operate this business called Wild Type. We're based in Mason, Michigan, and we do two things. We produce native plants and we provide ecological services. We do a lot of invasive species control, green infrastructure projects, botanical surveys, um, and a host of other things. Let's see how this works. There we go. So uh, the genesis of this talk began, I think it was in 2018. Um, to be honest with you, I was kind of tired of giving the four or five talks I'd been giving uh, at various conferences. Um, there is a lot of people out there that are communicating some of the same ideas and doing it a lot better, have better slides. And I was sort of taking a breather from, from giving talks like this. But I had the, the good fortune to have this, um, this brunch with a friend of mine who is an environmental attorney for the state. Very smart guy, but isn't a biologist. And he's asking me things about business and ecology. And we're talking about climate change and, and challenges in business. And he, after a few minutes of this, he turns to me and he says very simply, so what will a native plant nursery look like in 25 years? And uh, that, that turned my head. It really got me thinking uh, deeply about, um, about that question. And I'm still thinking about it. And from there, I was asked to give a talk at the River City Wild Ones, I think it was in 2019. And uh, this is kind of a geeky talk, okay? And it's gonna be um, not slide after slide of beautiful landscape shots. There's a lot of text slides. It's not a talk necessarily for everyone. I think there were certain, a certain segment of people at that, at that meeting that got something out of the talk and some may not have gotten as many. Now I know many of you at, at this chapter and I know you're pretty geeky. So, uh, so I, hope that, um, I hope that at least this resonates with some folks. And I will apologize right off the bat. There are a number of slides I've shown many times before and uh, they're incorporated into this, into this presentation. So uh, you've all seen this map many, many times. And um, if I'm gonna talk about the past, present and future, I have to start somewhere. And uh, I'm starting here at 1800 at the pre-settlement landscape. But this isn't really the beginning because if we could have drawn this map 500 years prior to this, this map would have been different, a little different. The landscape's dynamic things change all the time. They're changing due to a lot of anth anthrop anthropogenic forces, but even prior to European settlement, the landscape was changing all the time. But I really wanna start the past in the, in the near past. And that is when native plants became a sector unto its own. And that really began with Steve Cato, who is amongst us tonight, and the um, Donies who started Michigan Wildflower Farm. Steve had Nesta Prairie Perennials in Kalamazoo. The Donies started Michigan Wildflower Farm, which is now operated by Bill and Esther Dernwald. 
and I could be incorrect, but I do believe these were the two, first two native plant nurseries in Michigan. And uh, it began there and, um, and people began to recognize that this was something separate and distinct. Now, native plants have been part of commercial horticulture since the beginning, but people didn't recognize it as a separate thing. Uh, I can't remember exactly when, but it was roughly 24 or 25 years ago uh, when a group of us, Steve, Esther, Joel Richardson, uh, and a number of other people, uh, later Chad and at Hidden Savannah and Native Connections, we created this organization called the Michigan Native Plant Producers Association. And for many years, we worked on common problems. Um, and I think over the years, we, we accomplished those tasks. And we got to a point a number of years ago where we felt like uh, this organization had run its course and we disband it. Now, we didn't disband as a group of people. We're still a community of people. We, we do business together. Um, I call and cry on their shoulders. I ask questions. We're colleagues, friends, um, and customers of each other. So we as a group of people haven't changed, um, but we are not assembled as a organization anymore. And one of the, one of the challenges in maintaining the Michigan Native Plant Producers, from my perspective, is that it became increasingly complicated to create criteria that created a certain high standard or consistent standard, maybe as a, a fairer way to say it, of branding. Because when we look at the general community, uh, the way an ecologist defines native plant and a commercial grower defines native plant is different. The term's ambiguous. We can discuss geographic range and how that affects how we define a particular species, whether native ours are truly natives, uh, the importance of genotype. And, and all these things became uh, complications. But on a commercial basis, it was, well, um, we have primary growers, the people that actually grow the plants. What about the people who want to just sell the plants? This is a big part of commercial horticulture. And those people that want to sell plants, are they not native plant producers because they're selling some ornamental plants? Um, what about those that are growing native ours? So uh, over time, um, this is, became more complicated to create a, a group under a single, a single organizational structure. But over time, um, I have started to use the term restoration horticulture. I think it at least satisfies me. Uh, it's, it's more descriptive and uh, it, the, way I, the way I define it is it's where population genetics meets horticulture. And this is uh, most evident when you compare in contrast traditional horticulture and agriculture for that matter with restoration horticulture. In all forms of plant and animal breeding, whether it's horticulture, agriculture, uh, the, the, the idea is to create inbred lines where you select certain desired characteristics and you amplify, you concentrate and amplify, and you create a, a lot of homogeneity genetically, but a lot of uniformity in the population of plants or animals you're producing. If you're breeding cattle, if you breed Holstein to Holstein, you want Holsteins because you want the dairy production that that, uh, that particular breed has been selected for. Same with plants. You know, if you're uh, planting a LA of trees along an entrance of a corporate campus and you're using uh, autumn blaze, red maple, uh, you want those trees to have um, very similar branch structure and you want it to color up at the same time of year, you want that uniformity. It's, it's innervating to the eye, it's very, very beautiful. 
and there is nothing wrong with it. I'm not here to uh, criticize or denigrate that approach. We have all benefited by plant and animal selection. These are uh, lots of a lot, lots of advances in food production and plant and animal health have been accomplished through this sort of selective breeding. So in all forms of agriculture and horticulture, this has been the approach except for restoration horticulture. It's the exception. And this is where heterogeneity or preserving the genetic variability within the population, I believe is the goal. Mm -hmm. So the basic tenant of this kind of approach is really open pollination and letting these plants uh, recombine and reproduce on their own. Now, I apologize. I've used this slide for so many years and it is kind of, um, kind of a silly example, but I like using it because I think it explains better uh, at least my concern about using native R's in restoration uh, projects. I'm not against native R's in general for ornamental purposes, but uh, let me just uh, run this by the group. Uh, these two animals are really the same species. They're uh, Canis lupus, the uh, uh, domesticated dog and the gray wolf are the same species. They can interbreed. Some people might point out that they are different subspecies, but they do interbreed. Uh, we have over decades, centuries even, selected dogs to have specific characteristics that fulfill our needs, whether they're herding dogs or dogs like the dachshund that were bred to run down small holes. They have these short legs, long body, um, hunting dogs, birding dogs, they all have these, these selected characteristics that make them particularly good at a particular task. So we're looking at this dachshund, it has these short stubby legs, it's a wonderful pet, cute, cuddly animal, um, but it was really bred to hunt rodents. And they have selected this plant, uh, this, this dog that has a form of dwarfism actually, to have these short stubby legs. So I, I often tell this silly joke or this silly scenario that if you were, if you were in charge of reintroducing gray wolves to Isle Royal, you wouldn't introduce a dachshund, okay? And for the same reason, you wouldn't introduce a native R to a restoration. It's too inbred and it, it is not necessarily going to be quite likely not going to be well adapted to those conditions. Now, some people might argue that they would say, and this may be true in some circumstances, that over time uh, through uh, uh, cross-pollination, that these populations of native ours will be absorbed into and revert back to um, the, the native form. We've certainly see, seen this in invasive species like uh, hedge buckthorn, the, the columnar or fastigate form of glossy buckthorn does revert. This is a, the, a downside, but uh, it does revert back to its wild form after a generation. So here's an example of, we've seen lots of beautiful, uniform flowers. The form of this plant is uniform. Uniformity is really the key here. And this traditional horticulture is specimen, often spe specimen based. Each individual plant is, is meant to be seen and it, it contributes in an individual and identifiable way. This is a, a hallmark of uh, European design, much of European design and much of traditional horticulture in North America. Now, this slide, this is uh, Viburnum cassinoides. This is supposed to just illustrate this idea that if you're collecting seed from a population of this plant, for example, on any given day, there might be some, some individuals where the fruits have already dispersed and in the same population where some of the fruits 
have yet to ripen. And this is this is part of the the the, the tricks in the bag, the genetic bag, the diversity that allows these plants to to adapt to change in the environment. So uh, in some years that that particular individual that may have ripened its seed earlier may have had an advantage. In other years, maybe the later one might have had an advantage. Some may bloom earlier, they may get frosted. Some may bloom earlier and have an advantage that particular year. So just one of many examples you could attribute to the important diversity that, that uh, we want to maintain. Now, this is a, an urban-based project. Uh, it, is not, it is not specimen based, it's population based. Uh, these are uh, groups of plants that are meant to sustain themselves, not, it, not forever. This is a, just a rain garden, it's hemmed in by concrete, but it's meant to sustain itself by reseeding and natural other forms of natural propagation indefinitely. Okay. So in the spirit of this past, present, and future, uh, some of the, the trends I would, would uh, mention that I have seen in the time I've been doing this um, is quite a bit, uh, a, a, a much greater availability of species. When Steve was the only gig in town, he had great offerings, okay? But he was the only gig in town. There were no other plant producers at that time. Now there are multiple plant producers and maybe even as many as a couple dozen small native plant producers now in Michigan. Not to mention some of the larger companies that have always been producing natives. So there are many more sources and the number of species being offered has also in, increased quite a bit. Um, I mentioned that um, the aesthetic is slowly changing. I think more aptly, I should say, the acceptance of a new aesthetic is changing. And, uh, and Wild Ones has really been at the forefront of, of advancing that. The other thing I think Wild Ones has done a, a tremendous job doing is differentiating between gardening and naturalization. And there is a continuum here and understanding the continuum really helps us manage for habitat and enhance the aesthetic quality, which aesthetic quality is very important because many of these projects are, are being uh, done in urban and suburban areas where you have to find a way to, to garner acceptance by the public. So this continuum really runs from traditional landscape here at the top to true restoration in the bottom. And where I want to really concentrate is right here in the middle. So just to get started, I would call this uh, obviously very traditional. It's, um, it's specimen based, it's uh, very European based um, and it's in completely uh, assembled with non-native plants. Not that there's anything wrong with that. There's a place for this landscape for sure. Moving down the, the continuum or across the continuum, there are projects like this. This is the High Line in New York City, an amazing, an amazing landscape. Um, not just the plants, but the, all the landscape architecture, the, la the hardscape, the way the views are set up, um, the maintaining of the rails in certain places. It's really a, a enchanted place to visit in New York City. And this is a combination of native and non-native that the, the uh, garden design or landscape plants were designed by Pete Udoff. And many of you know that he uh, did a installation on Belle Isle, which is now available for public viewing and vis visitation. Um, this is not a low maintenance landscape. Uh, some people, maybe the Udoff group might, might suggest that, but this is definitely not low maintenance, um, but it is beautiful and it really combines 
uh, native with non-native, and it's not entirely specimen um, focused. It's very much population focused. And then there are, are your gardens. This happens to be my garden. And I have this gigantic snail that lives in my garden. Actually, that's a sculpture. And, um, and um, I have a very naturalized, I'm moving down the continuum here towards naturalization and not so much fussy, fussy gardening where I'm trying to maintain um, a, a scripted, defined and repeated uh, landscape forms. I'm letting things ebb and flow. I am, I am making the decision how far I'm gonna let things spread and I introduce things at will. I know where to get some plants and I in introduce them as I go. But this is very much a naturalized landscape. Here's another example of um, part of my landscape, which is just a, a, a wild, not a wild, but a rewild combination of, of ground covers. That's uh, ranunculus hispidus, strawberry, and potentilla simplex here. And I didn't, I put these plants uh, where I thought they should be. Uh, Jason and I were discussing this prior to the beginning of this talk and, um, and things kind of move and I let them move to where they really want to grow. I'm not that talented to really predict where things are always gonna grow. This is another project, which is a combination of, of, of population-based design and specimen planting. There are specimen plants in this design. I like to think of them as garnish in an otherwise um, complex recipe. And uh, this is a dynamic landscape as all good landscapes should be. It has interest all season long in the winter. It has things to see uh, in blooming most of the season. And just another, uh, another garden. I'm sure this looks like many, many of your gardens. Uh, this has, this is a, something that I did for one of my neighbors, but this has wild ones written all over it. And this is my front entrance. And uh, uh, as I, as since Steve is in the audience, uh, this prairie smoke uh, began with Steve. In fact, all prairie smoke. In Michigan began with Steve. So, um, and he has told and, and should retell that story. Um, but thank you, Steve. We have kept that line going for a long time. And that will relate a little later in the talk with some of the problems in terms of uh, inbreeding and such. Moving further down the continuum, there are like real restorations or real recreations. This is a bank stabilization planting. This is not a garden of any sort. Um, we, we planted it and we continue to maintain it. It does require some maintenance and we burn it periodically. Um, and this is in Williamston along the Red Cedar River. So the demand, um, the demand has increased a lot for native plants. This is a wonderful thing, but the demand is really high for a very small number of species. I like to say that 70% that of our sales are of only 30% of our species. So we're growing 300 species, but they're not being sold equally. Uh, we're selling a lot of a few things and very few of a much larger percentage of our offerings. This is like given the 64 box, uh, box set of crayons, and only deciding to use three colors, okay? We're giving our clientele, and I, I'm mostly admonishing the consultants, contractor, uh, consultants, designers, and engineers for not taking advantage of the palette of plants that they have at their disposal. They're using very, very few species over and over and over again. And as a, as a business owner, I have to, also deal with this, I have to grow the things people will buy because that's how I make payroll. 
it's it's just a unfortunate reality of operating a business. Now, I grow a lot of things uh, to the dismay of some of my staff over and over again, hoping that people will eventually uh, see the beauty and splendor in some of these plants. And over time, we have been very successful at introducing uh, not just our retail customers, but the engineers and consultants and such to a broader range of species. Now, I just said we're growing 300 species, but over the years, we have grown something like 450, maybe 500 different species of, of plants. But there's no market for a bunch of these plants. And from a restoration standpoint, we're still growing a very small percentage of the overall flora, which is over 1,800 native species. So if we're really serious about restoring the environment, uh, we really need to think about using more of the parts and uh, not limiting it to such a small, a small palette of species. There is a really important um, emotional and psychological, emotional slash slight psychological aspect to the plants we desire. We're making these decisions not truly or solely based upon their ecology or not even solely based upon their beauty. We are influenced by how familiar we are with these plants, their names can attract us or distract us or turn us off. And we really need to be thinking about how biased we are in terms of the kinds of plants that we choose to incorporate into the landscape in the name of ecological uh, integrity. So here is a highly abridged list of plants we can't give away, okay? And um, I don't expect you to, to read through this list, but I've highlighted a couple here and they kind of represent different, different issues. Um, we have things like striped maple where uh, there, are, there is interest, people know this plant, they have cottages up north, they contact us, they wanna plant a striped maple in Grand Rapids because they love this plant, but it's not gonna grow there. So, and it turns out that there's not that much restoration or that much population in places where striped maple grows and where it does grow, the people who are living there are preserving those plants. So there's very little market for striped maple, at least for, for my business. Then there are plants that are very beautiful like Spirea tomentosa steeple bush. I'm not sure that very many people know this plant. It's very beautiful, it's not real big, it's very attractive, it has textural uh, qualities to it that are really nice, but it does not grow in any environment. And this is one of the things that uh, the offerings that we sell at wild type are often plants that are quite generalist. This is a plant that has to have moist, sandy, acidic conditions or else it won't grow. And then the last example I, I'm gonna uh, point out is bog birch. And uh, this is a, a curious plant because it's found all over Michigan and this, the counties where there's no dot, uh, it probably is growing there, but no one has vouchered it. This plant is found throughout Michigan. It's common. But our consultants and engineers and landscape architects are unfamiliar and often have never even heard of this. A birch that grows in wetlands, that's a shrub, they just furrow their brow and they just can't believe it. It's very common. Uh, it, it seems to be fairly broadly adapted. And yet we see the same five wetland shrubs specified no matter where the project is located in the state. And I think that this is something that needs to, needs to change. So getting back to this emotional and psychological um, barrier to bringing more plants into the commercial native plant realm, uh, many people are adverse to things that have thorns and spiny things and vines, things like, like Smilax. Um, 
Greenbrier, briar, that sounds pokey. You know, it, people are turned off by this. We have plants that have names like bladder nut. Beautiful plant, but it has kind of an ugly name. Who's gonna buy bladder nut? Foul mana grass. Uh, the list goes on. Um, death camas, who's gonna buy that? So these things uh, create a certain bias in our plant selection. On the other hand, there are plants that are really, really beautiful, um, have great flowers, great form, easy to grow, broadly adapted, um, that are very unpopular. Wild senna, it's a big robust plant, but in the right place, it's stunningly beautiful and not very popular where a plant like ivory sedge, which is cute, beautiful, but it's just like a little clumpy grass is one of the most popular things in the nursery. It's hard to figure out. Um, this is a, a, a meant to be a little quiz. You guys are very geeky. You can, you can put the answer to what species this is in, the, in chat and we'll see how, I, I'm sure that in this group, um, there'll be someone or a group of people that will know this plant. This is another plant we can't sell. And, um, and if you know it, you're a geek. Lizard's tail, wonderful plant, has great, great utility in restoration, has some utility in rain gardens, broadly adapted, easy to grow, um, not very popular. Um, this is in our 70% of the plants that we don't grow, uh, don't sell a lot of. So uh, other trends that are of interest to me, um, I've been scanning through ag statistics in Michigan and I'm a member of Michigan Nursery and Landscape Association, um, which is kind of an odd pairing for me. I feel a little bit out of place there, but I've been a member for a long time. I just, just wrote an article about this subject for uh, upcoming uh, 100th year anniversary book for them. Um, looking through X statistics, I found out that Michigan has 600 nurseries. That's an enormous number of, of nurseries. And yet maybe 25 or 30, and most of them are very small, um, are native. That's a, a, a shockingly small percentage in number and in production. Because native plant production is really the foundation for all the spaces between the places. It's responsible for revegetating the vast majority of the landscape in Michigan, along our roads, around our airports, our campuses, our, our corporate campuses, stormwater, um, a huge amount of, of public land. And yet we have very, very limited production of these plants in Michigan. It's very unfortunate. Uh, something else I saw among these statistics is that um, tree production in Michigan has been decreasing for 10 or 15 years. And this is, this is purely an economic issue. It's not as profitable to grow trees as it is other crops in Michigan. The profitability has been going down because the trees that nurseries are selling in Michigan can be sourced from much less expensive places because their production costs are low, lower because their growing seasons are longer. Places like Oregon, people are surprised to hear how, much, how many trees come out of Oregon that end up in Michigan. Southern Indiana, Ohio, Tennessee, Kentucky, the Carolinas, um, even Northern Georgia. Um, a lot of production comes from out of state. Now, to me, this is concerning because there is a, a much larger carbon footprint moving something so heavy interstate. But there is another concerning aspect, and that is when you're moving plant material from one place to another, you, you increase your chances of moving weeds, invasive plants, insects, pathogens, and, uh, and we have seen the result of this. Uh, dogwood anthracnose is just one example of a, a 
uh, disease that has been moved on nursery stock. And there are many more. So when we look at the entire, uh, we, we look at everything, all the lawn mowing and landscaping businesses and nursery production, it's about $5.7 billion in Michigan. And on this pie chart, you can see the piece that represents native plants and and, um, ex and and native plants and ecological services. You can all see the piece of that pie, right? Of course not, because it's so small. You'd need an electron microscope to see that slice. It is so infinitesimally small. You can't see it when you look at the entire pie. Very very small. So getting back to this question, what is a native plant nursery gonna look like? We have climate change, we have all kinds of development. We have, we've made our parts of our landscape inextricably altered. We've changed microclimates and soils and um, lots of other environmental changes. So it is, a, it is a legitimate question and it's one worth pondering. So I'm very interested in the, in the intersection of environment and economy, or more specifically in the intersection of environment and business. And we really need to, not just in, in the plant world, but in all parts of our economy, we have to create an economy that makes doing the environmentally appropriate thing uh, advantageous. It should be the thing that is the most profitable, not the least profitable. But right now in the native plant world and in the, in the world of uh, ecological contracting and providing ecological services, opportunities, I think, abound right now. And for those people that may be, may be interested in starting businesses or working for someone who is already established, think now is as good a time as any. There, this is the good news. It's a great time to be working in this field. The bad news is it's because we've done so much, so much damage to the environment. So some other things that we're seeing presently and, and for sure gonna be seeing in the future is loss of species and, and really collapse, uh, habitat uh, loss and collapse of ecosystems. Um, this is not entirely due to changing climate, but it's, it's certainly partially due and increasingly due to changing climate. But we have invasive species problems that in some cases are exacerbated by climate change, but these were problems even probably before the climate was changing significantly. And one thing that Tom mentioned that I'm very concerned about is there is a shrinking uh, ambient gene pool of our native plants. And this gets back to what I was saying about uh, Steve's collection many, many years ago, 30 years ago, I'm not sure, long time ago, when he had the ability to collect um, uh, plants that were going to be otherwise bulldozed of prairie smoke. And this is, I consider prairie smoke kind of a novelty plant. People love it and uh, people put it in their garden. It's not usually used in restoration, but because this plant is so uncommon and it is protected, you can't regenerate or, or re-infuse the population of plants that we're growing. We're growing in this particular case, the same genetic line that was handed to me by Steve Cato 25 years ago. So, and I would assume, unless people are collecting this from the wild, um, that, that a lot of the prairie smoke that is out there has come from that original collection. We want to avoid that whenever we can. And to do that, we need access to collecting sites. And those collecting sites are becoming fewer and far between and the ones that exist and the ones I've been collecting on for many years are becoming increasingly impacted by, among other things, invasive species development, 
and all the other things we're aware of. So I, this, I've already kind of outlined what I wanted to say with this slide is seed collecting becomes more challenging. Um, our business is growing, we need more seed, we need more seed, but seed is harder and harder to come by. And we go to great efforts to collect our seed from not just multiple individuals within a population, but multiple populations within Michigan. Within the, We're lucky here that uh, Michigan is definitely a political boundary, but most of it is bound by water. So we're collecting multiple populations from within uh, the various ecoregions found in Southern Lower Michigan. Just a younger version of me. I guess that dates from September uh, 2011. That's a long time ago. Um, so to speak to this group that we in our, in our customers, people commonly come to the nursery and they want trillium and they want lady slippers and they want a lot of things that are probably not going to be available anytime soon. But we do want to know what you're interested in and we are interested and in, oftentimes we can produce these plants. And we have had a number of really fortuitous um, requests from uh, landscape architects from time to time and from homeowners that are interested in certain species that others eventually find to be as useful and as beautiful. Uh, there, are, there are certain groups of plants that are often very hard to find. Things like uh, ephemerals, woodland ephemerals, submergent and emergent species and ferns. These are all, each one of these is a separate kind of horticulture, takes um, different techniques, timing, um, business model, uh, they're challenging, they're slower, they can be expensive to produce. Now, wild type and other nurseries as well, but wild type is making some inroads. We're working on, on each one of these groups and we're making some progress. Are we gonna have Trillium? No, probably not in my time working in, in this field, but we are increasingly producing uh, more ephemerals, emergence and ferns. We are um, very proud to say that we have increasingly am increasing amounts of Michigan lily, enough to satisfy the demand. I'm not sure where that level is. We're a ways away from reaching saturation, but our production has probably quadrupled or more in the last two or three years. We have learned to produce this plant. Just another beautiful picture. Those are plants that we produced. Uh, we are increasingly learning how to grow uh, emergent species like Peltandra. This is Sagittaria. We're growing pickerel weed and a variety of other things. Uh, there is no aquatic nursery in Michigan. So if you're doing a really large project and we see these all the time where they need thousands of these kinds of plants, we are not Wild type is not capable of producing 5,000 or 10,000 Sagittaria in a year and commensurate amounts of, of pickerel weed or Peltandra or a host of other things. So all those projects are being filled by firms outside of Michigan. It seems like there is an opportunity. Now we are producing hundreds or maybe a thousand or maybe a couple thousand of each one of these things, but those are very low numbers relative to the, to the demand for these kinds of plants. The future brings uh, problems, as we know, uh, brings opportunity, and I don't think it's all gloom and doom, but um, we have new pests being introduced all the time. Viburnum beetle particularly likes Viburnum dentatum. We will be dramatically reducing the production of this plant over the next couple of years. And it may be eventually we'll stop producing it. We have oak wilt and we have all kinds of other uh, uh, problematic new uh, insects, diseases and invasive space, species on the horizon.
uh, we have to think about um, new management and, um, and gets acceptance. Now, I, I'm using this slide for drama, but, um, but the, it's very easy to get people to accept mowing 25 times a year and listening to the drone of the lawnmowers and, and the weed whackers and the snow and the um, leaf blowers. But there are other kinds of management that are simpler, quieter, lower, less impactful that do not have broad acceptance. And uh, contractors are un accustomed to doing these kinds of things and it requires a change in model. And this is something that we have to work towards in the future. And then I'm gonna uh, sum up my, my talk um, Uh, sum up my talk with uh, just a little bit on assisted migration. This is something that is uh, being talked about quite a bit, you hear it in the popular press even. Um, and to some people, and uh, some people they think, well, this is a great idea. The climate is warming. Let's move plants from Southern latitudes to Northern latitudes. That makes sense, right? Well, that's a gross oversimplification of what's going on really. And, um, and we need to be uh, rather cautious about it because it's not just the climate warming uh, in Michigan and in pretty much everywhere else that precipitation uh, is changing. The time of year and the amount of rain and snow we're getting is changing. This, this has a profound impact on, on our ecosystems and, and particularly on the plants. So the, the models, or at least the models that I am watching and paying most attention to because they seem to be most accurate or seems to be um, coming to fruition is that over time, not only is our climate in Michigan gonna become warmer, it's gonna become drier and it's gonna become drier. Uh, we're gonna have prolonged periods of drought in the summer punctuated by heavy rains, which sounds like this year, we had an incredibly long dry spell in the spring. It's hard to remember that because we've had so much rain, but we had a very dry spring. And then we've had um, a lot of rain this year, but the rain has been heavy, really heavy. And that's just one, one data point. In, and you have to look at a lot of data to draw these, these models. So, uh, time will tell, but I think this is, uh, this is the future. But assisted migration is, is something that we have to consider. And there are a myriad of other things we have to be considering in terms of um, the phenology of these plants, the pollinators that, 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 uh, that pollinate them, um, whether we're moving just genotypes or new species north, what are what the expected impact will be on the existing flora. Um, but there are several things that are not changing. The topography is not gonna change. The soils, the latitudinal difference in daylight is not gonna change. Photo period is not going to change. And that's gonna have a big impact on whether uh, these plants are successful or not. Assisted migration is something that uh, probably will come to fruition to some degree. I know Mitch Laddow at, at um, Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy is working on this. Uh, he's part of a larger grant and many other people working on it across the country and around the world. Um, and we'll see what happens. One thing that I hope is not overlooked is preserving the local genetics because I think that at least in some cases, we have enough genetic variability within our populations to take on some of the adaptation that's gonna be required. Thanks. All right, thank you, Bill, for that geeky talk. <laughs> I, think, I think we all geeked out on that. Um, I know that there were several questions and, and comments, and we have a few minutes to, to get to those. Uh, um, 
Gail had asked if there was a, a list or a website available of Michigan native plant producers. Uh, Anne had provided a couple, including wildflowersmich.org. Are there others that you would suggest to the group? Well, I have, um... I have a list I just keep on my computer. And when I hear of a, a nursery, um, I put it on a spreadsheet and I would be glad to send it to you and you can circulate it. And uh, one thing to remember is, it, is consumers, it's important to really understand, um, I am not vetting any of these. So some of these folks may be growing very few natives, but they are growing some natives and they, they um, are, a presence in their community. Others may be growing only wild types. Some may be growing only native ours. So um, unlike when we were in MNPPA where we had a certain criteria you had to meet to become a member, this spreadsheet is if I hear someone that's interested in growing natives commercially, I'm putting it on the list and I will send that to you. Great. Um, the uh, mystery plant. We had a few guesses of service berry or alamanquier or alamanquier. Uh, no, not, not service berry or amelanquier. Those were good guesses, but the leaf wasn't serrated. Uh, Any other guesses? I don't, I don't see the chat on my screen. Uh, um, let's see. In fact, I'm gonna stop sharing. Those, those were all of the guesses. We, we only had a few. Anyone else want to? Okay, Gail says spice bush. Can you see that? Yeah. Um, no, that is a plant called mountain holly. It's ilex. Um, it, Nemo, it used to be called nemopanthus. It's now an ilex. And it's a, it grows in, in, in acid, uh, boggy kinds of places. And it's, it's not that uncommon in Michigan, but it's you really have to be looking for it because it blends into the landscape. It's a cool plant, we've grown it, no one buys it. Someone had asked an interesting question to the group uh, that a couple of people responded to um, between genetic diversity and the quote unquote pure Michigan genotype, which side do you all lean towards? Yeah, uh, Steve had said, you know, collecting from the wild was never easy um, <clears throat> and it's, requires being an active preacher to get customers to buy diversity. Uh, so he was giving you kudos. Do you, any, any comments on that, Bill? Well, um, thanks, Steve. Um, Steve was very, very important guy when I started out. He's an important guy now, but um, he was very um, helpful to me. And he has many quotable things that we uh, often, um, often, uh, repeat that uh, I've learned from Steve. So, um, um, but uh, wild collecting is difficult, but by far it is one of the most enjoyable parts of my work. And um, uh, I love doing it. I'm walking around in places, I'm falling all the time. I'm tripping, I'm, I come back bruised beaten up. I don't even know where I got the puncture wound in my side and I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. So that, that I guess would bring us to the last question from Anne. She was just wondering about what restrictions there are on collecting seeds from the wild, such as spring ephemeral seeds. So uh, there are, um, so plants that are protected uh, and if you want to an easy way to reference this, I would go to michiganflora.net. It's the University of Michigan's uh, online herbarium. And it's once you get used to using the website, I use it several times a day. Um, you can reference these plants and find out if they're extirpated or threatened. Um, so those, those plants are, are off the table unless they are collected from cultivated populations like the one Steve provided with prairie smoke. Um, but a lot of ephemerals are not protected. Tons of them are not protected. Uh, the the uh, Trillium grandiflorum, the most common trillium, is not protected. Um, so uh, 
that, that aspect of collection is, I think, pretty clear. Um, it is important to get permission to collect. I have arrangements with private landowners, uh, some park systems, some conservancies, um, always trying to uh, figure out new places to collect. It's kind of like garage sale shopping. You know, you go to a lot of crappy garage sales and then eventually you find one that has a Rembrandt, you know, you, you stumble upon a site that's just amazing. It, you got to kiss a lot of toads to find a prince. It, you go to a lot of bad places before you find some good sites. But I will tell you, and I'm not uh, ashamed to tell you this, um, I will collect in some places without permission where I'm probably not supposed to collect. And these are places that are being absolutely destroyed and disrespected. And so, um, um, uh, and th this does not include private property. There's lots of private property that's being destroyed and disrespected. I don't trespass in those kinds of, of places. But um, I, I have collected on many railroad right of ways without permission, and um, and they're welcome to come after me. Um, they're spraying a maze here and running fiber optic cable, and then sowing cool season grasses and um, and uh, I have just become a little bit uh, more belligerent or uh, irascible about this sort of thing. But in general, it's really important to get permission. And this is a big impediment because th there's a lot of things I have to drive two hours to get that if I had permission within a local, my local area, I could collect. And so this actually adds to the carbon footprint and, um, and it adds to the time and expense necessary to collect these seeds. You're being called a native Avenger. <clears throat> <laughs> I've been called By worse. Steve, he's laughing. Um, <laughs> well, with that, we are at time, but Bill, thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, it is being recorded uh, and will be available uh, for you to review and to send to family and friends. Uh, again, thanks to Tom and Anne for coordinating and for introducing our wonderful speaker. And we have uh, our last uh, presentation Let's see, next month, it is November 17th at 7 p.m. Uh, again, on Zoom, it's Native Gardens come in all shapes and sizes, Alicia Babcock and Kim Patry. So we hope you uh, join us then. With that, thank you all and have a great night. Thank you.